brought to you by Enzo. This is Yellow is a Primary Color. Hey everybody, welcome back to Yellow is a Primary Color, the show that paints the Asian experience as we navigate adulthood in full color. Hosted by Enzo, your local media house that highlights emerging Asian identifying artists and shades free creative labor. I'm Serena. I'm Megan. I'm Jeannie. I'm Natalie. And we're here to remind you to be the primary color of your own life. Man, I just have to say, it's good to be back. How are you guys feeling? Feeling good. Feeling fresh. Mm-hmm. Feeling excited. Yeah, we're back Ooh. for episode two, which is great. I know we're all wondering the same thing, but what are we dipping our brushes into today? So today we do have a bit of a heavier topic for you guys. Um, we're going to dip our brushes into the Asian hate movement that's been going on lately. What? Stop Asian hate. Why are we hating Asians? I don't know. I guess we're going to have to find out. Jeannie, do you know why we're hating on Asians? <laughs> well, yes, Serena, I do. So there has been a surge of Asian hate crimes here in Toronto and around the world. In fact, there, there has been a 51% increase since 2019 into 2020. Bro. So, um, Wait, 51% increase? Is that in Toronto? In the world? Yeah, it's in Toronto right now. And one in three of assaults have been... Um, have suspects pl- blaming China for COVID-19. What? So, yeah. Damn. 51% increase just in Toronto, just in this, our city. That's incredible. That's crazy. Okay, okay. So let's put it back into the frame. I know that a lot of us have gone through COVID-19 in our own personal experiences. So I'm kind of just wondering, when did you guys know when COVID was a lot bigger than than what we like initially imagined it to be yeah well um for me um my i guess initial reaction to the whole COVID-19 situation was a little different I think because I had heard about the situation in uh I think it was Wuhan originally uh Mm -hmm. for a while I think like even back in December they were talking about it and then after like the new year uh, we heard that someone had brought it to Canada, like the first person. And then, so I was thinking, well, it spread so fast in China, and then they could barely keep up with it. So I really don't have a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> she said no. <laughs> Zero faith. Yeah. So I was one of those people that wore masks pretty early on, before, way before it was mandatory. But there was a little bit of fear going outside and like commuting to school all the time because I wore a mask and I was basically the only one um, on the TTC or on the bus who was wearing one. I was scared that I was going to be targeted for that reason. Mm. So, Yeah, how have you guys felt like COVID-19 and the rise of Asian hate has like, affected you or like your families? Like, have you guys been like thinking about your parents? Uh, I think for me, when it was declared a pandemic, the rise of Asian hate crimes, my, at first I was really afraid of my parents just going grocery shopping for essentials just because they are older. Um, and obviously, you know, health could be better. And all the statistics would say, you know, if you're 50 and above, you know, you're a little more at high risk. And that was my immediate fear. And, and it was so scary because obviously as parents, you know, you you want to take care of your kids. You don't want to put your kids in harm. But it was a weird time where the tables turned where we had more power out in the world. And I always encouraged my parents to stay home, um, mostly because of COVID. I was originally fearful of COVID. And it's and I saw this meme on Instagram where it said um, along the lines of um, in 2020 I was afraid of my parents going out to get COVID but in 2021 I'm afraid of my parents dying at the hands of someone else and it's it's so fearful it's and coming yeah. from like Natalie and I come from a small very white town um London Ontario London Ontario <laughs> um just it's just like there there there's definitely diversity here however I think there's it's pockets of diversity if we're leaving those pockets I I fear for my parents safety I fear if someone's going to call them COVID-19 or they're going to walk away from them a little 
more and things like that. It's just like, why should why should I worry as my parents' child for my parents' well-being and if a stranger is going to spit on them or not? And it, it was just it was just such a weird point of life where I was genuinely fearful of myself leaving the house and my parents leaving the house because you never know what's going to happen. And my parents who have come to Canada as to seek refuge and happiness and have seen Canada as a land of opportunity, they would never think of even hesitating to walk up the door in case another Canadian assaulted them. That's not on the radar at all, but for some reason it was on mine. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. And that was my experience with COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah, I like totally resonate with that. Like I feel like once the Asian hate crimes started rising with COVID, it's like almost like we became parents a little. Like I feel like for a lot of us it just created like a lot of anxiety. Like, yeah. You're, yeah, you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about your parents, and you see on the news, especially with, like, the Atlanta shootings, like, that was Hit home. crazy. Yeah, absolutely. it was, it was, yeah, absolutely. And I remember even seeing, like, um, one of, like, the kids, like, he posted on social media yeah. about, like, his, like, experience with that and, like, his mom passing, and it, like, literally brought tears to my eyes. Like, that could have been, like, any one of our parents, mm-hmm. which is really scary. Uh, this one time after class, me and Natalie were actually walking down Chinatown and we saw newscasters. Do you remember this, Natalie? Yeah, I, I remember this. This was like really early on, like right before COVID became like a thing. And it was kind of like something that was only happening like in Wuhan and in China. Um, I remember like the news was like, I personally thought that the news was being a little problematic. Mm, what problematic? We saw, like, we, yeah, because we saw the newscasts, people... In Chinatown, like they were on Spadina Street, and it looked like they they were talking about something COVID related. And I remember me and Serena kind of looked at each other, and we're kind of like, "Why are they here? Like of all places, why are they in Chinatown talking about COVID?" And that's what I noticed too. If you watch the news back, like in like April or like March of like two thousand twenty or twenty twenty. Sorry, I was supposed to say two thousand nineteen. In twenty twenty, um, they used a lot of like imaging of. East Asian people when they talked about COVID and it was kind of like okay like here's COVID Mm -hmm. a threatening pandemic and here's a picture of an Asian person and it was kind of weird because it's like why are you so like associating those two things together basically yeah it's like I kind of understood like they needed like stock images to fill like a story or something and like context but I feel like it did a lot of damage personally yeah it was my absolutely messed up. I remember my immediate thoughts. Like, Nali and I were walking by and we saw, like, the big news truck, all the cameras, and a news reporter just in front of one of the grocery shops. And as we're walking, I was like, Nali, I swear to God, if I hear COVID, <laughs> I I'm going to lose God. myself. And then I remember we, like, kind of stood there. I'm like, no, let me just eat for one second. <laughs> just standing there right behind the news reporter. They weren't recording, but then I heard them, like, kind of, like, going through the script. It's just like, yeah, COVID-19. I'm like, there it is. There it is. You're- there it is. And you're using Chinatown as the establishing shot. And, like, and like again, with, like, from, like, a media perspective, we understand the industry. We know we- you need establishing shots. You- we know that you need context, but the context is driving the wrong narrative here. Like, Chinatown went down first in Toronto. Um, yeah. Businesses were scarce. And what what angers me is that people don't understand that the people that live in Chinatown and occupy this space, they've been doing so for generations. They're just as Canadian as me or a lot of these listeners right now. And they're getting hate. And like, if you're someone that frequents Chinatown, you would know these people are so hardworking. They they mm-hmm. do so much. And they're... And, and it's again, like, with Asian elders, it's... They see Canada as so much opportunity. And it's just, it's just so unfair. <laughs> like... It sucks. It sucks a lot. And media played a big hand. They did. And I feel like even if it was unintentional, it's like, you still did it, though. Yeah. 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 And all the, like, the businesses that were affected during COVID, like not just with COVID, but also like Asian hate, like a lot of Asian businesses went down, received a lot of hate. Mm-hmm. Um, 
yeah, I guess like the media, like they never took responsibility for that because they 100% played a role. And I also feel like it wasn't talked about enough. Like no one really questioned it until like, we were kind of like, wait, isn't that kind of weird? It's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Asian people are seen as a model minority. Um, and my parents always taught me to fly under the radar. Don't cause drama. Like accept, accept any hate and just like walk away. And like, I'm not saying they're saying, I'm not saying that the messages don't stand up for yourself, but it's, there's a conflict, just walk away. Um, don't cause drama. And like, that's something that my parents have always ingrained in me. Mm-hmm. And I definitely see it as we see elders in our community constantly getting bombarded and they just walk away. And what, what even makes me more angry is that all of the Asian attacks for the most part are on the elderly. These people do nothing. Like, they came here with my parents are both people like they they came with physically nothing in hopes for success and you're gonna attack people that are just like my parents as like ah oh, oh, girl modern minority girl that's all i have to say <laughs> yeah it's for sure the passivity of just our upbringing The reason why the model minority myth is harmful is that it denies the racism and slavery that happened and it sort of justifies the divide of the white and black. I just want to quote Ellen Wu, Professor Ellen Wu. So there's a quote from the book Asian American Studies Now by Wu and Chen and it reads, in 1974, Frank Chen said, whites love us because we're not black. Asian Americans were not Black in two ways. They were both politically silent and ethnically assimilable. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that quote was very um, insightful because it sort of summarizes why model minority is a thing and why it is harmful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you, Jeannie. (sighs) That was incredible. That quote hit another spot. And even like... Just like the mental health aspect of it, um, mono minority. I mean, if we look at socioeconomic status as a as a whole, we 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 are economically insignificant. But even in our home, our, our homes, especially as younger Gen Zs, in um, with both people as parents, I feel like there's just a big generational gap between us two. Where, as well, for me as a second generation Vietnamese person, and with parents as both people. There's just always this gap where you you don't talk about your feelings. Um, we we yeah. we've been through so much. We can't talk about it because if you talk about it, you're weak or I don't know. We're always just taught to repress, like repress, repress, repress. If something bad happens, get it get over it. You have to learn on your own, which is is kind of difficult because we're also in this generation where we're Instagram influence you have to learn how to be transparent you have to learn how to be very in tune with your mental health and emotions but just in a family dynamic just our parents are like nah 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 chill 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 um I will handle this all, all on my own and even our parents like we never see our parents cry really and when that happens you know it's a lot mm-hmm mm-hmm and it just really shows like the generational trauma that Asian people have endured, and the and the generational trauma that we have inherited. <laughs> inherited, oof, woof. Unfortunately, but woof. Yeah, it's weird because I feel like yeah, I do feel like North America kind of puts Asians into like that box, and it's like not only do we like instill those values in ourselves. But, like, it's, like, kind of, like, what people expect of us, too. And you're Mm -hmm. right. Like, people kind of take advantage of that. Like, with the elderly attacks and things, like, they know that we, yeah, we are kind of passive or we feel like we shouldn't be throwing hands or anything. Like, they're not, you're not expecting an elderly Asian person to throw hands at someone, you know? Yeah. Um, Except, shout out to that one woman, I think it was New York, that Wait, what happened? I don't remember her name, but please do the research um there was this situation i i want to say new york but she was just chilling outside this white man just ran over and punched her in the face she was 65 (gasps) years old she got punched (gasps) in the face bloody nose Mm -hmm. black eye and then she turned around i forgot what she was holding but she beat the heck out of this man like 
beat him like paramedics came by to roll this guy away and she was screaming uh, i think a mandarin but she was just yelling like why are you bullying us stop bullying us blah blah someone made her a gofundme she raised over one million dollars and she she donated all profits back to the stop asian hate movement and incredible 65 year old Whoa. woman like and the, if you watch this youtube clip she has like bruised eyes she has ice and she's just screaming like stop bullying us and she's crazy she's the Absolutely goat crazy. she's Absolute the goat. goat that's like <laughs> that story made me feel so warm like and and it was just so nice because i'm so used to us mm-hmm. just taking just taking it don't take it fight the power but that's not but yeah <laughs> Switching gears into more of our art topics, we kind of noticed there was kind of a birth of a lot of art communities during this movement alongside with COVID and Asian hate crimes. So I was wondering how you guys have thought, how has the Asian hate movement affected the creative communities or the communities that we've been in and like on social media? I feel like the best art comes from revolution and Mm. like, just like, you know, art history class, like the Dadaist movement, the Cubism, all of these things are influenced by macroeconomics. And I feel like all the, the best art, like I heard this quote, but art is politics. Art is literally a reflection of the world we live in. And I feel like a, a lot of creatives, they use art to juggle their feelings, the way they process emotions. And I feel like because of all of the trauma that we've been through these past almost two years there's a lot of people channeling that those emotions into art Mm -hmm. and kind of reclaiming our space in society empowering each other um and a lot of like you know small local artists are donating 100 percent of the profits towards initiatives that are going to do more work and literally there's a thousand words a picture is worth a thousand words yes that's (laughs) That's yeah. the saying. Period. <laughs> so, period. So, so much symbolism, so, so many different meanings. And I feel like when art is put into the community, because of all of us with our unique stories, we're going to interpret this one piece differently to our own discretion. And yeah, there's just like a lot of small initiatives like that where local artists are putting their art forward for a social cause. And I think there's something in that that's just so impactful, so beautiful it's art for a purpose mm-hmm. art all art has purpose but this is a little a little extra a yes. little more special i totally agree like art is inherently political whether you think of it as not because yeah it is up to people's interpretations and i also love how art is just so accessible like anybody could look at a piece of art and have their own interpretation or whatever and like i love how on especially on instagram like i think we've all seen like the rise of infographics yeah which i mean it is a bit overboard at this point but it like it is very effective like i think that in itself is art like it's graphic design people are taking like really hard to read information and then creating something someone will actually look at like i know a lot of people are like kind of making fun of it at this point because like someone would talk about like a really serious topic but like the infographic would be like pink with like flowers and like in cursive it'd be like how to, how to deal with toxic people and then it'll be like literally in cursive with flowers around it and it'll be like a 10 like page stack and it's kind of funny but i will say it is effective it is effective. You know? Yeah, I mean, like, you clicked on it, right? Yeah, I, I clicked on it. I talked you about through, it. You I scrolled scroll through, through all ten pages. Yeah, you're like, I'm learning things, but also I'm appreciating the aesthetics. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's what I love about art. It's just, like, it makes things so easy to understand. Especially during times like now where there's just so much information coming out and we're trying to, like, educate people on all of these really serious topics. It's a really good, like, vehicle to, like, mm-hmm. do that in. I know with like the Stop Asian Hate movement, it did arise mainly because of the Atlanta shootings that happened earlier in the year where six of the eight people who were killed in the shooting were Asian women. And then there was that huge uproar for like maybe a week. Like it really did not feel like long. 
So, like, I'm just wondering, do you guys feel like the movement is still, like, is it still here? Do you guys still feel it? Like, do you think people care enough? It's definitely weakened, I would say. Yeah. Um, and I, I obviously don't want to compare this with another situation, but just thinking about, like, the power the voices during BLM or even currently with Palest- pa- Palestine and Israel. I feel like right now during COVID, there's been a lot of ethnic uproar. There's a lot. I think now that we're at home and the spread of all of these infographics and education, we're learning that a lot of ethnic groups do face their own struggles. And I do agree that we're not seeing that much attention towards the Stop Asian Hate movements. But I, I want to blame it. I don't even want to say the word blame because there's a negative connotation. But I do want to say that it's because there's a part of me that's like, we kind of have to take care of our own before we take care of others. Like, yes, we should be putting our energy out, but also at the same time, like, make sure you're eating, make sure you're drinking water, blah, blah, blah. Like, self-care. The, self-care. And there's so much happening right now. Do I wish that Stop Asian Hate was louder right now of course but at the same time there's so many more situations there's so many things to worry about where i'm not hurt that we're not getting the same traction because there's so much happening we're in a global pandemic right now there's there's so much overwhelming and just like it's a lot when you open instagram you see all these infographics of random situations that you have to share about you have to share this gofundme you have to donate you have to take a pledge and honestly just as an individual just as a human, I'm I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just tired. Mm. I just wish everyone could see, like, yo, like, the world is on fire right now. And it takes a whole community to, like, take it out. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the world was, like, always on fire. And suddenly, like, we're all kind of like, yeah, it's on fire, yeah. guys. Is it kind of like that analogy of that frog in the boiling water? It's like, mm. you just kind of turn it up a little bit and you don't really notice and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we say it. the end I thought, yeah, I thought you were going to talk about that meme with the dog with all the fire that's like oh yeah he's fine. like I'm fine <laughs> yeah this is fine oh, that's what I was thinking that's what I imagined yeah. too this is fine um, the world is tearing apart and there's so many socioeconomic problems <laughs> this is fine yeah it's more like you don't you don't really notice until it's gotten really bad or it's too late so how do you think that we can help or how can the audience help with these movements yeah so how can we help um we can be mindful of using asian stereotypes in conversations and also kindly call out a friend for their microaggressions if it comes up and we can also advocate for diversity and inclusion in our own community um, and support local asian-owned businesses Mm -hmm. and just like be nice Be nice. Be nice. Have compassion. So that's it for our show today, guys. Remember to check out our resource collection um, via Instagram at Enzo Showcase, which is the link in our bio for uh, local Asian Canadian organizations to support. And make sure to follow us as well for our updates about new episodes and any projects or collaborations that we have in the future. So thank you all for listening today to the second episode of Yellow is a Primary Color and take care of yourself. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay home and keep being the primary color of your life. Yellow is a Primary Color is hosted by Serena Nguyen, Natalie Nguyen, Megan Lau, and Jeannie Liu. It's produced by CJRU 1280 AM 